coming together and uh, inscribing our relationship to psychoanalysis, to the works of Freud, of Lacan, um, via, via this uh, virtual means. Um, so first of all, I would like to welcome you all um, to thank you for being there um, for making the time, the space, the effort. Um, and uh, especially I'd like to thank um, Neus Carbonell, uh, our guest reader um, today for the second chapter of Civilization and its Discontents. Neus is a psychoanalyst uh, member of um, the school in Spain and of the World Association of Psychoanalysis. Um, she's based in Barcelona. Neus is a good friend of ICLO. Um, she has been um, uh, an, an inspiration and a support, especially for the special interest group on child and adolescent psychoanalysis that is uh, run uh, within ICLO. Uh, she has visited us uh, several times. Um, she's also going to be a guest uh, lecturer in our um, clinical and theoretical program, uh, the Nottingham Dublin uh, Lacanian Studies program next year. At least that's what's uh, in in the plans, we'll see. Um, but I'm delighted to welcome you, Neus, today, um, and uh, very grateful that you have accepted uh, the invitation to be part of this initiative. Uh, we also uh, thank uh, Caroline Hinu, who is a member of ICLO, um, a very active member uh, in our psychoanalytic community in Dublin. Uh, she's going to be a reader today. Uh, Caroline is uh, a practitioner in Dublin in private practice. Um, and uh, you may have received more details about who our um, reader and commentators are today. So. I'll refer you to that. Before we begin, um, I would also like to um, thank the Bureau of ICLO for supporting this uh, space and for uh, having made it possible. Um, we, um, uh, we decided because last week there were people who um, couldn't get into the um, seminar uh, to, to take some steps to make that possible, um, especially Linda Clark and Cecilia Saviotti, who are uh, working tirelessly in, in organizing this. Linda, I'm going to ask you, because I see the number is 97, uh, I'm going to ask you to be attentive in case the technicality about the limit of 100 of participants is um, arising again so that we can uh, make sure that uh, if people are trying to log in um, that they can. Uh, Cecilia, if you're there already, uh, maybe you'll have a look uh, to see if there are any emails from people trying to get in and join. Um, and uh, a few a few practical remarks that uh, I, I would like to make. Um, there is a chat that you can use, yes, so don't hesitate to use it. Um, it's a very uh, interesting tool. Um, the last time uh, dialogues between participants happened, people uh, could write their own um, thoughts about uh, what was being discussed and uh, we're going to keep that uh, that we can use afterwards uh, as part of our work. Mm -hmm. So if you have questions, if you have remarks, if something that uh, in the reading has uh, caught your attention, don't hesitate to use the chat um, uh, to, to say it. Simon is um, 
asking, do you have the reading? Um, if that question is still there, Simon, uh, please write a little bit more. Um, and if you have headphones, uh, we've been told that the sound image balance um, is, is better if you use headphones, um, but that may not be the case. So perhaps you want to test that. Um, the last thing that I'm going to communicate that's important is that you don't need to register again for the remaining six meetings. Um, you have the dates of the meetings in your email. If you can't find your email, you can always consult the iClo website. Um, but also the same ID and or link that you used for today uh, is valid for the next remaining uh, meetings, okay? Um, so I think that was all. I have some uh, little uh, announcement to make, but I will do that at the end of our meeting. So I wish everyone a good... Uh, Good work, and I pass now the uh, floor to Caroline. Thank you. In this chapter two, Freud is looking at the program of happiness which we search for, which he says is impeded uh, in our suffering in three ways, the body, the external world, and the social bond. Chapter two, in my future of an illusion, I was concerned much less with deeper sources of the religious feeling than with what the common man understands by his religion, with the system of doctrines and promises, which on the one hand explains to him the riddles of this world with enviable completeness, and on the other, assures him that a careful providence will watch over his life. And Sorry, Caroline, a, lit yes. a little bit louder, please. And will compensate him in a future existence for any frustrations he suffers here. The common man cannot imagine this providence otherwise than in the figure of an enormously exalted father. Only such a being can understand the needs of the children of men and be softened by their prayers and placated by the signs of their remorse. The whole thing is so patently infantile, so foreign to reality, that to anyone with a friendly attitude to humanity, it is painful to think that the great majority of mortals will never be able to rise above this view of life. It is still more humiliating to discover how large a number of people living today who cannot but see that this religion is not tenable, nevertheless try to defend it piece by piece in a series of pitiful rearguard actions. One would like to mix among the ranks of the believers in order to meet these philosophers who think they can rescue the God of religion by replacing him in by an impersonal, shadowy, and abstract principle, and to address them with the warning words, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And if some of the great men of the past acted in the same way, no appeal can be made to their example. We know why they were obliged to. Let us return to the common man and to his religion, the only religion which which ought to bear that name. The first thing that we think of is the well-known saying of one of our great poets and thinkers concerning the relation of religion to art and science. He who possesses science and art also has religion, but he who possesses neither of those two, let him have religion. This saying, on the one hand, draws an antithesis between religion and the two highest achievements of man, and, on the other, asserts that as regards their value in life, those achievements and religion can represent or replace each other. 
if we also set out to deprive the common man, who is neither science nor art, of his religion, we shall clearly not have the poet's authority on our side. We will choose a particular path to bring us nearer an appreciation of his words. Life, as we find it, is too hard for us. It brings us too many pains, disappointments, and impossible tasks. In order to bear it, we cannot dispense with palliative measures. We cannot do without auxiliary constructions, as Theodore Fontaine tells us. There are, perhaps, three such measures. Powerful deflections, which cause us to make light of our misery. Substitutive satisfactions, which diminish it. And intoxicating substances, which make us insensitive to it. Something of the kind is indispensable. Voltaire has deflections in mind when he ends Candide with the advice to cultivate one's garden. And scientific activity is a deflection of this kind too. The substitute of satisfactions as offered by art are illusions in contrast with reality. But they are nonetheless psychically effective thanks to the role which fantasy has assumed in mental life. The intoxicating substances influence our body and alter its chemistry. It is no simple matter to see where religion has its place in this series. We must look further afield. The question of the purpose of human life has been raised countless times. It has never yet received a satisfactory answer and perhaps does not admit of them. Some of those who have asked it have added that if it should turn out that life has no purpose, it would lose all value for them. But this threat alters nothing. It looks, on the contrary, as though one had a right to dismiss the question, for it seems to derive from the human presumptuousness. Many other manifestations of which are already familiar to us. Nobody talks about the purpose of the life of animals, unless perhaps it may be supposed to lie in being of service to man. But this view is not tenable either, for there are many animals of which man can make nothing, except to describe, classify, and study them. And innumerable species of animals have escaped even this use, since they existed and became extinct before man set eyes on them. Once again, only religion can answer the question of the purpose of life. One can hardly be wrong in concluding that the idea of life having a purpose stands and falls with the religious system. We will therefore turn to the less ambitious question of what men themselves show by their behavior to be the purpose and intention of their lives. What do they demand of life and wish to achieve in it? The answer to this can hardly be in doubt. They strive after happiness. They want to become happy and to remain so. This endeavor has two sides, a positive and a negative aim. It aims, on the one hand, at an absence of pain and unpleasure and, on the other, at the experiencing of strong feelings of pleasure. In its narrower sense, the word happiness only relates to the last. In conformity with this dichotomy in his aims, man's activity develops in two directions according as it seeks to realize, in the main or even exclusively, the one or the other of these aims. Caroline? Yeah? Are you using headphones? Yes. Can we try without the headphones? Okay. Sorry everyone for the interruption. I'm going to ask participants to give us a sign if the sound is better now, okay? Thank you. As we see, what decides the purpose of life is simply the program of the pleasure principle. 
This principle dominates the operation of the mental apparatus from the start. There can be no doubt about its efficacy. And yet its program is at loggerheads with the whole world, with the macrocosm as much as with the microcosm. There is no possibility at all of its being carried through. All the regulations of the universe run counter to it. One feels inclined to say that the intention that man should be happy is not included in the plan of creation. What we call happiness in the strictest sense comes from the preferably sudden satisfaction of needs which have been dammed up to a high degree and it is from its nature only possible as an episodic phenomenon. When any situation that is desired by the pleasure principle is prolonged, it only produces a feeling of mild contentment. We are so made that we can derive intense enjoyment only from a contrast and very little from a state of things. Thus, our possibilities of happiness are already restricted by our constitution. Unhappiness is much less difficult to experience. We are threatened with suffering from three directions, from our own body, which is doomed to decay and dissolution, and which cannot even do without pain and anxiety as warning signals, from the external world, which may rage against us with overwhelming and merciless forces of destruction, and finally, from our relations to other men. The suffering which comes from this last source is perhaps more painful to us than any other. We tend to regard it as a kind of gratuitous addition, although it cannot be any less hatefully inevitable than the suffering which comes from elsewhere. It is no wonder if under the pressure of these possibilities of suffering, men are accustomed to moderate their claims to happiness, just as the pleasure principle itself, indeed under the influence of the external world, changed into the more modest reality principle. If a man thinks himself happy merely to have escaped unhappiness or to have survived his suffering, and if in general the task of avoiding suffering pushes that of obtaining pleasure into the background, Refre reflection shows that the accomplishment of this task can be attempted along very different paths. And all these paths have been recommended by the various schools of worldly wisdom and put into practice by men. An unrestricted satisfaction of every need presents itself as the most enticing method of conducting one's life but it means putting enjoyment before caution and soon brings its own punishment. The other methods in which avoidance of unpleasure is the main purpose are differentiated according to the source of unpleasure to which their attention is chiefly turned. Some of these methods are extreme and some moderate, some are one-sided, and some attack the problem simultaneously at several points. Against the suffering which may come upon one from human relationships, the readiest safeguard is voluntary isolation, keeping oneself aloof from other people. The happiness which can be achieved along this path is, as we see, the happiness of quietness. Against the dreaded external world, one can only defend oneself by some kind of turning away from it if one intends to solve the task by oneself. There is indeed another and better path, that of becoming a member of the human community and with the help of a technique guided by science, going over to the attack against nature and subjecting her to the human will. Then one is working with all for the good of all. But the most interesting methods of averting suffering are those which seek to influence our own organism. In the last analysis, all suffering is nothing else than sensation. It only exists insofar as we feel it. 
and we only feel it in consequence of certain ways in which our organism is regulated. The crudest, but also the most effective among these methods of influence is the chemical one, intoxication. I do not think that anyone completely understands its mechanism, but it is a fact that there are foreign substances which when present in the blood or tissues directly causes pleasurable sensations. And they also so alter the conditions governing our sensibility that we become incapable of receiving unpleasurable impulses. The two effects not only occur simultaneously, but seem to be intimately bound up with each other. But there must be substances in the chemistry of our own bodies which have similar effects. For we know at least one pathological state, mania, in which a condition similar to intoxication arises without the administration of any intoxicating drug. Besides this, our normal mental life exhibits oscillations between a comparatively easy liberation of pleasure and a comparatively difficult one, parallel with which there goes a diminished or an increased receptivity to unpleasure. It is greatly to be regretted that this toxic side of mental processes has so far escaped scientific examination. The service rendered by intoxicating media in the struggle for happiness and in keeping misery at a distance is so highly prized as a benefit that individuals and peoples alike have given them an established base in the economics of their libido. We owe to such media not merely the immediate yield of pleasure, was also a greatly desired degree of independence from the external world. For one knows that with the help of this plan of cares, one can at any time withdraw from the pressure of reality and find refuge in a world of one's own with better conditions of sensibility. As is well known, it is precisely this property of intoxicants which also determines their danger and their injuriousness. They are responsible in certain circumstances for the useless waste of a large quota of energy which might have been employed for the improvement of the human lot. The complicated structure of a mental apparatus admits, however, of a whole number of other influences. Just as the satisfaction of instincts felt happiness follows, so severe suffering is caused us if the external world lets us starve, if it refuses to sate our needs. One may therefore hope to be freed from a part of one's sufferings by influencing the instinctual impulses. This type of defense against suffering is no longer brought to bear on the sensory apparatus. It seeks to master the internal sources of our needs. The extreme form of this is brought about by killing off the instincts, as is prescribed by the worldly wisdom of the East and practiced by yoga. If it succeeds, then the subject has, it is true, given up all other activities as well, he has sacrificed his life. And by another path, he has once more only achieved the happiness, quietness. We follow the same path when our aims are less extreme and we merely attempt to control our instinctual life. In that case, the controlling elements are the higher psychical agencies which have subjected themselves to the reality principle. Here, the aim of satisfaction is not by any means relinquished, but a certain amount of protection against suffering is secured, in that non-satisfaction is not so painfully felt in the case of instincts kept in dependence as in the case of uninhibited ones. As against this, there is an undeniable diminution in the potentialities of enjoyment. The 
the feeling of happiness derived from the satisfaction of a wild instinctual impulse untamed by the ego is incomparably more intense than that derived from sating an instinct that is being tamed. The irresistibility of perverse instincts and perhaps the attraction in general of forbidden things finds an economic explanation here. Another technique for fending off suffering is the employment of the displacements of libido, which our mental apparatus permits of, and through which its function gains so much in flexibility. The task here is that of shifting the instinctual aims in such a way that they cannot come up against frustration from the external world. In this, sublimation of the instincts lends its assistance. One gains the most if one can sufficiently heighten the yield of pleasure from the sources of psychical and intellectual work. When that is so, fate can do little against me. A satisfaction of this kind, such as an artist's joy in creating, in giving his fantasies body, or a scientist in solving problems or discovering truths, has a special quality which we will certainly one day be able to characterize in metapsychological terms. At present, we can only say figuratively that such satisfactions seem finer and higher. But their intensity is mild as compared with that derived from the Satan of crude and primary instinctual impulses. It does not convulse a physical being. And the weak point of this method is that it is not applicable generally. It is accessible to only a few people. It presupposes the possession of special dispositions and gifts, which are far from being common to any practical degree. And even to the few who do possess them, this method cannot give complete protection from suffering. It creates no impenetrable armor against the arrows of fortune, and it habitually fails when the source of suffering is a person's own body. While this procedure already clearly shows an intention of making oneself independent of the external world by seeking satisfaction in internal psychical processes, the next procedure brings out those features yet more strongly. In it, the connection with reality is still further loosened. Satisfaction is obtained from illusions, which are recognized as such without the discrepancy between them and reality being allowed to interfere with enjoyment. The region from which these illusions arise is the life of the imagination. At the time when the development of the sense of reality took place, this region was expressly exempted from the demands of reality testing and was set apart for the purpose of fulfilling wishes which were difficult to carry out. At the head of these satisfactions, through fantasy, stands the enjoyment of works of art an enjoyment which, by the agency of the artist, is made accessible even to those who are not themselves creative. People who are receptive to the influence of art cannot set too high a value on it as a source of pleasure and consolation in life. Nevertheless, the mild narcosis induced in us by art can do no more then bring about a transient withdrawal from the pressure of vital needs, and it is not strong enough to make us forget real misery. Another procedure operates more energetically and more thoroughly. It regards reality as the sole enemy and as the source of all suffering with which it is impossible to live, so that one must break off all relations with it if one is to be in any way happy. The hermit turns his back on the world 
and will have no truck with it. But one can do more than that. One can try to recreate the world, to build up in its stead another world in which its most unbearable features are eliminated and replaced by others that are in conformity with one's own wishes. But whoever, in desperate defiance, sets out upon this path to happiness will, as a rule, attain nothing. Reality is too strong for him. He becomes a madman who, for the most part, finds no one to help him in carrying through his delusion. It is asserted, however, that each one of us behaves in some one respect like a paranoia, corrects some aspect of the world which is unbearable to him by the construction of a wish and introduces this delusion into reality. A special importance attaches to the case in which this attempt to procure a certainty of happiness and a protection against suffering through a delusional remolding of reality is made by a considerable number of people in common. The religions of mankind must be classed among the mass delusions of this kind. No one, needless to say, who shares a delusion ever recognizes it as such. I do not think that I have made a complete enumeration of the methods by which men strive to gain happiness and keep suffering away. And I know too that the material might have been differently arranged. One procedure I have not yet mentioned, not because I've forgotten it, but because it will concern us later in another connection. And how could one possibly forget, of all others, this technique in the art of living? It is conspicuous for a most remarkable combination of characteristic features. It, too, aims, of course, at making the subject independent of fate, as it is best to call it. And to that end, it locates satisfaction in internal mental processes, making use in so doing of the displaceability of the libido of which we've already spoken. But it does not turn away from the external world. On the contrary, it clings to the objects belonging to that world and obtains happiness from an emotional relationship to them. Nor is it content to aim at an avoidance of unpleasure, a goal, as we might call it, of weary resignation. It passes this by without heed and holds fast to the original, passionate striving for a positive fulfillment of happiness. And perhaps it does, in fact, come nearer to this goal than any other method. I am, of course, speaking of the way of life, which makes love the center of everything, which looks for all satisfaction in loving and being loved. A psychical attitude of this sort comes <coughs> enough to all of us. One of the forms in which love manifests itself, sexual love, has given us a most intense experience of an overwhelming sensation of pleasure and has thus furnished us with a pattern for our search for happiness. What is more natural than that we should persist in looking for happiness along the path on which we first encountered it? The weak side of this technique of living is easy to see. Otherwise, no human being would have thought of abandoning this path to happiness for any other. It is that we are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love, never so helplessly unhappy as when we have lost our loved object or its love. But this does not dispose of the technique of living based on the value of love as a means to happiness. There is much more to be said about it. See, chapter 4, page 101. We may go on from here to consider the interesting case in which happiness in life is predominantly sought in the enjoyment of beauty. 
wherever beauty presents itself to our senses and our judgment. The beauty of human forms and gestures, of natural objects and landscapes, and of artistic and even scientific creations. This aesthetic attitude to the goal of life offers little protection against the threat of suffering, but it can compensate for a great deal. The enjoyment of beauty has a peculiar, mildly intoxicating quality of feeling. Beauty has no obvious use, nor is there any clear cultural necessity for it, yet civilization could not do without it. The science of aesthetics investigates the conditions under which things are felt as beautiful, but it has been unable to give any explanation of the nature and origin of beauty. And as usually happens, lack of success is concealed beneath a flood of resounding and empty words. Psychoanalysis, unfortunately, has scarcely anything to say about beauty either. All that seems certain is its derivation from the field of sexual feeling. The love of beauty seems a perfect example of an impulse inhibited in its aim. Beauty and attraction are originally attributes of the sexual object. It is worth remarking that the genitals themselves, the sight of which is always exciting, are nevertheless hardly ever judged to be beautiful. The quality of beauty seems instead to attach to certain secondary sexual characters. In spite of the completeness of my enumeration, I will venture on a few remarks as a conclusion to our inquiry. The program of becoming happy, which the pleasure principle imposes on us, cannot be fulfilled. Yet we must not, indeed we cannot, give up our efforts to bring it near to fulfillment by some means or other. Very different paths may be taken in that direction. And we may give priority either to the positive aspect of the aim, that of gaining pleasure, or to its negative one, that of avoiding pleasure. By none of these paths can we attain all that we desire. Happiness, in the reduced sense in which we recognize it as possible, is a problem of the economics of the individual's libido. There is no golden rule which applies to everyone. Every man must find out for himself in what particular fashion he can be saved. All kinds of different factors will operate to direct his choice. It is a question of how much real satisfaction he can expect to get from the external world, how far he is led to make himself independent of it, and finally, how much strength he feels he has for altering the world to suit his wishes. In this, his psychical constitution will play a decisive part, irrespectively of the external circumstances. The man who is predominantly erotic will give first preference to his emotional relationships to other people. The narcissistic man who inclines to be self-sufficient will seek his main satisfactions in his internal mental processes. The man of action will never give up the external world on which he can try out his strength. As regards the second of these types, the nature of his talents and the amount of instinctual sublimation open to him will decide where he shall locate his interests. Any choice that is pushed to an extreme will be penalized by exposing the individual to the dangers which arise for the technique of living that has been chosen as an exclusive one should prove inadequate. Just as a cautious businessman avoids tying up his capital in one concern, so perhaps worldly wisdom will advise us not to look for the whole of our satisfaction from a single aspiration. Its success is never certain, 
For that depends on the convergence of many factors, perhaps on none more than on the capacity of the psychical constitution to adapt its function to the environment and then to exploit that environment for a yield of pleasure. A person who is born with especially unfavorable instinctual constitution and who has not properly undergone the transformation and rearrangement of his libidinal components, which is indispensable for later achievements, will find it hard to obtain happiness from his external situation, especially if he is faced with tasks of some difficulty. As a last technique of living, which will at least bring him substitute of satisfactions, he is offered that of the flight into neurotic illness, a flight which he usually accomplishes when he's still young. The man who sees his pursuit of happiness come to nothing in later years can still find consolation in the yield of pleasure of chronic intoxication, or he can embark on the desperate attempt at rebellion seen in a psychosis. Religion restricts this play of choice and adaptation, since it imposes equally on everyone its own path to the acquisition of happiness and protection from suffering. Its technique consists in depressing the value of life and distorting the picture of the real world in a delusional manner, which presupposes an intimidation of the intelligence. At this price, by forcibly fixing him in a state of psychical infantilism, and by drawing them into a mass delusion, religion succeeds in sparing many people an individual neurosis, which hardly anything more. There are, as we have said, many paths which may lead to such happiness as is attainable by men. But there is none which does so for certain. Even religion cannot keep its promise. If the believer finally sees himself obliged to speak with God's inscrutably to priests, he is admitting that all that is left to him as a last possible consolation and source of pleasure in his suffering is an unconditional submission. And if he is prepared for that, he could probably have spared himself the detour we have made. Over to you, Nails, for your commentary. Thank you okay. for this reading. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, ICLO uh, Seminar for this invitation, especially I would like to thank Florencia for uh, this uh, invention that uh, has proven to be uh, successful because it raises a lot of uh, interest uh, on all of us. So I am very pleased to be uh, here today and I am very pleased to have uh, the chance to do uh, a reading or a commentary on, on, chapter, on this beautiful chapter of civilization and its discontents. I would like to, uh, I'd like to begin my commentary on chapter two, on this uh, chapter, with a reflection that uh, Jacqueline Miller uh, made in, a, or you can find this uh, reflection by Jacqueline Miller in a beautiful interview he gave in Barcelona. It's an interview that was published under the title of for the freedom of speech. On that occasion, Miller said, and I quote, Lacan had a great ambition for the analyst. He thought that when they had finished their analysis, they would converge with the movement of their times. What it means to converge with the movement of uh, our times can be understood at least in this occasion that gathers all of us uh, here in this virtual space, with an expression that uh, Roger Little used last Saturday. 
Roger spoke of the legibility of the world. And I would like to link this expression with a reminder that Florentia Shanahan made uh, also last Saturday when she pointed out for us the role of the analyst as a reader. What letter does the analyst read? The letter of Duisance, of course. Certainly, if there is a function of the analyst beyond the comfort of the private cabinet, it has to do with the capability of reading the modes of Duisance of their time. No doubt, this is a great ambition. Sometimes, as we know, psychoanalysis runs ahead of the analysts themselves. However, if we have decided to gather together during eight sessions, it is because we feel concerned with this ambition that Lacan had. Then it is under the heavy, strange and uncertain conditions of these days that a collective reading of civilization and its discontents has all its pertinence. In fact, we can we could summarize in one way, it's not the only one, we could summarize the issue, uh, the theme of this book as the question that Freud poses about the price to pay for civilization. In fact, uh, the title itself contains this question and also the answer. The price uh, for civilization is the malaise, the happiness, the discomfort, the discontent. Then back to chapter two. Chapter two is at first sight an inquiry about happiness. However, a thorough reading of it reveals in fact that this chapter is an inquiry about satisfaction and desire, jouissance and desire. An inquiry that is oriented with the notions that Freud himself had invented. That is, the Oedipal father, the pleasure principle, and most importantly, the death drive. This later one, the death drive, we know it, is the key concept that Freud developed nine years ago, or nine years before, see, nine years before civilization is discontent, in the text beyond the, beyond the pleasure principle. And then almost a hundred years later, Freud's text help us to read our historical moment, but we are privileged to have as well the elements that Lacan put at our disposal. Of the elements that Lacan uh, gave us, I am going to uh, select three that I find particularly relevant uh, for the reading of this chapter. The first, the first one is what Lacan himself named the great secret of psychoanalysis. He named it like that in, in Seminar 6, and that is that there is no other of the other, which affects, you know, this uh, secret affects directly the capacity of the father to comfort, to provide the good solution to the problem of Jewish science. The second notion that I want to uh, underline today is the fact that the very structure of Jewissance is the structure of addiction. As uh, Lacan reveals with the concept, the concept of the plus de jouir, plus of Jewissance. And finally, the third point I want to underline now is that in the 21st century civilization, unlike prior forms of human civilization, is not built upon the regulation of Jewish sons, but quite to the contrary. Due to the techniques that science has put at our reach, satisfaction is nowadays, uh, we can call satisfaction the form of social organization. In this sense, we can say that we are fully immersed 
in what Lacan names uh, in seminar 19, the regime of the one, the one of Jewish science. So these are the three uh, Lacanian notions or uh, concepts that I wanted to have uh, present for the reading of this chapter. Because in this, uh, in this chapter, Freud uh, poses the question, if humanity can fulfill uh, its desire for happiness, by which means happiness could be reached. Freud takes a starting point, and that is that for Freud, civilization demands that every human being pays with a loss of satisfaction in order to become a member of the human club. To identify as a member of humanity has a cost that translates into a loss of Jewish science. This is in fact the main teaching of the Oedipal conflict. Castration makes then the quest for happiness a failed quest from the start. Every human being one by one, has to come to terms in its own singular way with this fact of the structure. I would like to outline then one sentence that I found revealing in this sense in which I'm talking about. And I quote um, from this chapter, I quote Freud, happiness in the reduced sense in which we recognize it as possible is a problem of the economics of the individual libido. There is no golden rule which applies to everyone. Every man must find for himself in what particular fashion he can be saved." Unquote. I would like to underline, first of all, this expression, the economics of the individual's libido. This is the great Freudian discovery that we find in this chapter we are discussing. Behind the ideal of happiness lies nothing but the libidal economy of each subject, each speaking being, we can say nowadays. This Freudian truth leads to another truth that we learn from Lacan, that is, there is no other economy than the economy of Jewish science. In fact, experts say that when the health crisis is over, the health crisis we are living nowadays, we will be, we will be faced with a severe financial crisis. What psychoanalysis has to say to the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, or the Federal Reserve, could be something along the lines of, sirs, madams, the secret is that there is no other economy than the economy of Jewish science. This is exactly what Freud encounters at the very moment he's looking for the key to answer the quest for happiness in the human being. And I would like to contrast this sentence I just quoted with uh, another sentence, well, this sentence that I just quoted, uh, we may synthesize it as, to everyone, its particular happiness. Uh, and I would like to contrast this uh, Freudian sentence with the opening sentence of Leon Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. It is a famous line. Many of you are perhaps familiar with it. Uh, Anna, Karenina, Anna Karenina opens as follows, and I quote, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, unquote. Tolstoy says then, there is identity in happiness and peculiarity in unhappiness. Freud's and Tolstoy's statements seem one to be the opposite of the other. When in fact, when, put them, when we put them together, they point at the paradox of Jewish sense. A paradox 
that a young autistic man spelled out very clearly. This patient of mine had only one question, which he repeated to everyone. His question was, why can one measure degrees of discomfort, but comfort cannot be measured? You are either comfortable or you are not. However, you can be uncomfortable in degrees. That for this man was this question and he kept repeating it to everyone he met. And in fact, this young man lives his reality according to measures of discomfort. For instance, chairs or tables have all their measures, but also people, and I must say that uh, young, gentle and attractive women rate among the less uncomfortable. But he states clearly that real comfort, comfort at 100%, he says, is death or sleeping. Then the line between pleasure and unpleasure is in fact a Moebius band. I think that this is one of the possible readings of a statement that Lacan make in 1977. In, he said, castration is jouissance. Quite the opposite of what we read in today's uh, chapter of Freud. Or perhaps this castration is jouissance, is the full consequence of what we read in this text. Psychoanalysis begins with Freud's idea that the fee to be a member of the human club is castration. This is what the myth of the Oedipus illustrates. And Lacan transforms this myth into the very structure of language, the very necessity of having to pass the man by the chain of signifiers introduces a loss. But most important, Lacan discovers that it introduces also a plus, the plus of Jouir. Freud begins associating the yearning for happiness with the yearning for the father. The father as the one that would teach us how to enjoy. The father as the other of the other, the guarantee against the real, the function of God. This is an aspiration that returns periodically even in the age of science, we are not free from religion. That is, religion as the production of meaning and ultimately the meaning of existence, which is also what Freud addresses in this chapter. Even in our times, when the inexistence of the other seems so clear, the aspiration for the father as the other of the other returns under the form of the strong leader, as Gustavo de Salle reminded us last Saturday. However, this strong leader has its own counterpart with the modest leader or the expert or a combination of both as we find today in the managing of crisis by governments. Freud uh, dedicates an important part of this chapter to discuss the tension between satisfaction and happiness. Freud echoes the general idea that if satisfaction could be fulfilled, men then would be happy. But as young, my young autistic patient knows, that would be only possible in death or sleep. Very Freudian indeed, beyond the pleasure principle, the death drive. Freud examines the different ways by which this structural impossibility has been treated. 
mentions religion, powerful deflection, substitute satisfaction and intoxication. Science, art, beauty, love, fantasy, and intoxicating substances are forms of dealing with satisfaction either by means of displacement, sublimation, or in the most extreme case, by feeding the demands of the drug with substances, toxic substances. I want to pay attention to the mention that uh, Freud makes of, and I quote, the worldly wisdom of the East and practiced by yoga. This is uh, quite at the end of this chapter that he mentions that. And I want to mention it because uh, Lacan makes a slight reference to this in the class nine of seminar 19, Au Pire. Um, Lacan uh, in this class has uh, some beautiful paragraphs devoted to what he calls, and I quote in French, le savoir de la jouissance, uh, knowledge of enjoyment. I'm going to translate it provisionally like this, knowledge of enjoyment. This is what Lacan finds in religions such as Buddhism, the tantras, the meditation, the yoga, and also, for instance, in Sufism, in Islam. Lacan says that all religions, except for Christianity, are founded on this knowledge. Regarding philosophy, Lacan situates a break with this savoir de la jouissance after Socrates. Lacan makes a complex argument that I am not going to develop, but that it has to do with the role of castration in enjoyment in jouissance. But I want to remark what Lacan states. He says that after Socrates, the knowledge of jouissance is left at the margins of civilization, causing, and I quote, what Freud modestly named the discontent. What is then this savoir de la jouissance? It is not a knowledge about jouissance. It is a knowledge of jouissance. I think that this the difference between about and of, no? this the savoir de la jouissance, I think that this is the key to it, and I hope to be able to prove it uh, later on. Freud, uh, as we can see from the reading of this uh, chapter, Freud is pessimistic when it comes to happiness. At the beginning of this chapter, we find the following statement, and I quote, the intention that the man should be happy is not included in the plan of creation, unquote. And at the end, at the end of the chapter, and I quote, the program of becoming happy with the pleasure which the pleasure principle imposes on us cannot be fulfilled." Unquote. This is the conclusion that Freud reaches at the end of the chapter after analyzing the different means by which the human being tries to find happiness. We can see that this conclusion is somehow developed in Seminar 7 by Lacan. There Lacan shows that happiness as a sovereign good, which is the way Lacan translates the sumum bonum, which is found in Aristotle's, Aristotle's ethics. This sovereign good does not exist, Lacan says. And Lacan says, the analyst should know this from the start because he will be asked for it. He will be asked for the 
sovereign good. In seminar, uh, uh, like analyzes some of the aspects we find in this Freudian text. Uh, somehow in seminar seven, Lacan says that desire brings dissatisfaction and lack. Desire makes it impossible for the subject to find a conciliation with the drive, with the satisfaction of the drive. In fact, in Kant with Sade, Lacan states, and I quote, happiness is denied to whomever does not renounce the pathway of desire. We find this in the Creed. There, is also, there are also some very interesting references to the demand of happiness, the demand for happiness to the analyst in the direction of treatment. And the Sorry, Neus. Yes? Neus, can I ask you to read that quote from Kant with Sad again, please? Happiness is denied to whomever does not renounce the pathway of desire. This is in page 663 of the... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. There are, and I, I would like to add that there are also some very interesting references to the, demands, to the demand for happiness to the analyst in the direction of the treatment and the principle of its powers, which I am not going to extend on, but you can find them very, very enlightening. However, Lacan states something slightly different in television television in the other ecri. There we read that speaking beings are happy. Lacan says happy by nature. That is at the level of the drive the speaking being is always happy. In this sense the end of analysis involves the resolution the tension that we find in this chapter that we've read between desire and jouissance, desire and satisfaction, or jouissance and castration. This is what the end of analysis should find a solution. The end of analysis is formulated then as a way of doing differently with the drive. In the Italian note, for instance, Lacan speaks of the enthusiasm of the analyst. It is, of course, an informed enthusiasm that results from the knowledge or the savoir obtained from an analysis. A savoir about, or a savoir de la jouissance. Uh, let's say, that this happiness is not based, the happiness, the happiness that psychoanalysis can, uh, uh, can see at the end of an analysis, is not a happiness based on having or expecting, but in a different experience of satisfaction. It is in this way, that psychoanalysis becomes a savoir de la jouissance, a knowledge of jouissance, a knowledge of satisfaction. But it is a savoir knowledge that is not religious and that is singular to a, a, to a speaking being, to only one speaking being one by one. And this is what psychoanalysis has to offer to the speaking being who dares to take the challenge of an analysis. This is another experience of the drive 
And this other experience of the drive is what should enable analysts to converge with the movement of their time as it was Lacan's ambition. Well, thank you. This is, I stop here my commentary. Okay, Neus, thank you very much. Um, uh, I don't know, Linda, uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, we, we, we have a, a better sound, I think, yes. Um, thank you very much, Neus, for this um, punctuation, the, the extraction of some elements uh, of, of Freud's chapter. And um, in, in a certain way, it's uh, how each commentator will put the magnifier on a particular notion or a particular aspect. I liked very much that it was um, very clearly connected with, uh, uh, with what we're going through, if, if, if one can make an, a statement like that, hmm? because what we are going through uh, is, is already a generalization. Uh, so, I'm going to uh, let people know that among many miscalculations that we, we had, uh, in, in fact, I'm going to, to take full responsibility for that. Uh, uh, there were several miscalculations. And one was in terms of the time that we had available. Uh, and uh, I, I completely miscalculated the time that the reading would take. I thought it was going to take much longer. And the, the bright side of that is that it leaves us with quite a, quite a bit of time for discussing and for um, hearing uh, other voices as well. Um, so I've noted did a few questions that emerged during the very interesting exchange. Now, you, you obviously couldn't follow the exchange, but it was superb. And um, we're going to, uh, for sure, we're going to make something out of, of this because we can actually keep a copy of all the chat that, that happens. So um, perhaps uh, before going to those three questions that I noted, and people can also prepare you know, their own questions and ask to be unmuted so we can hear your voices. I'm going to ask you now about the last part uh, when you spoke um, of um, the end of analysis or what an analytic experience can um, aim at producing because one of the the things that we decided for the reading was that we were the reader wasn't going to read the footnotes yeah because it would complicate too much the reading it, it would really invade the um, uh, um, it would invade the flow of the text but there is a footnote on page 80 where Freud talks about the profession, yeah, one's profession. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, he quotes Voltaire and um, he talks about uh, what, what, what one does as an occupation, uh, how, can, how can that uh, uh, become a, uh, an exit way for some of these dilemmas. Hmm? And it occurred to me that it could perhaps be connected with Lacan's idea of, of the desire of the analyst as the product of an analysis. Not so much in terms of an occupation, but of a, uh, of a very peculiar desire, let's say, which is not the desire that you were talking about, the, the neurotic desire that is in, in a 
constant conflict with the mode of jouissance or the drive. So perhaps if, if you want to keep that question or say something now. I keep it and we take more questions. Okay. I have Gustavo or can can say hello. like to say something, but I have first uh, um, Marina, Marina, can you hear us now? Hello? Hello? Hello, Mer uh, Neus, can, Hi. You, can you hear? I now can hear you, yeah. Okay, okay. So Marina Veneca has a question about the sentence where Freud speaks of in intoxication of beauty, that beauty can be intoxicating. That's one question. Hmm? And the other, uh, okay, we'll, we'll go with that one and then we'll go to Gustavo, okay? Okay. The, what is the question? If you can make some remark about beauty as intoxicating. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, shall I answer then your question and Marina's question? Okay. See what I can say about it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting uh, the remark that Freud makes as beauty as intoxicating, and I I thought about it, and it's true that that uh, what uh, Freud says is that beauty has not. Uh, that doesn't serve to any purpose, but uh, that is not uh, is is not useful. Uh, doesn't doesn't have any aim. But it's true that beauty as intoxicating means that there is the effect that beauty produces on the body. This is beauty as a body event that we could read. It. Obviously, Freud doesn't have uh, this. Uh, this notion, but I understood it in this way, the same way that when one takes an intoxicating substance that has an effect on the body, that beauty has an effect on the body. And it's very interesting that then uh, Freud talks about beauty uh, as a, um, a sexual um, a relationship between beauty and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And if he makes this connection, it is because there is this, real, this effect that beauty has on the body. Huh? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a very subtle, I, I appreciate this remark because it's something very subtle that, uh, yeah, uh, it uh, points at something that psychoanalysis, uh, especially psychoanalysis with Lacan, uh, with the last Lacan, we see the effects of the signifier on the body, the effects of. I think we're having some connection problem. Uh, we have lost news. Can uh, anybody? Yeah. No, no. Uh, everybody has lost the connection with news. So. Um... There you are, Neus. You're back. Can you hear us? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. so you're back. With the, the, we lost the connection for a moment. Is it my connection or it's your connection? It, that's very difficult to know, Neus. It's difficult to hear me? Uh, no, now it's okay. Okay, okay. Well, uh, going back to this question of the beauty, um, I want to remark that beauty, in terms of like, in terms of Lacanian reading of it, beauty depends on the signifier. So it's the effect of the signifier of the body that can has this effect of jouissance. Mm. 
So, uh, yeah, this is the way I would understand the sentence that beauty is intoxicating. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can I ask, I take one second Hello? To, to say, uh, to ask if, if others can hear Neus? We're, we're, no, we're losing her. Hello? Yes, Neus, um, for some reason, we're yes. yes, you're we are losing you. So if you have maybe your phone on, perhaps you turn it off or is it not on? No. No. It is not okay. on. I well, can I can hear her perfectly. We'll we'll continue. Okay. Okay, this is one the, the other question about the professions. Um well I think that uh, uh the profession as an exit way, it's uh we can understand it in this text in as a sublimation or as a displacement of satisfaction. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, something different then uh, is the question for the analyst. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, something different, I think, is uh, the question of the desire of the analyst because um, uh, it's true that um, when Lacan talks about the analyst and the desire of the analyst, doesn't use the term sublimation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it uses uh, the sicut palea of uh, Saint Thomas. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that it would be very interesting to develop uh, to develop the true the, the two differences. And why, uh, in fact, we could say that being a psychoanalyst is not a profession. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is an experience. It is an ethical experience. It is an experience of Jewish science, but not uh, in the way a profession is. So it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting question that you, that you make, Florentia, that would... Uh, <laughs> that would deserve uh, a we'll, development. We'll work on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gustavo. Yes, hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, Gustavo. Hello to everybody. Hello, Neus. Thank hello, you so Gustavo. much for your thoughtful comments. Uh, and just a few words about something I would like to dwell on. Um, uh, I think that this, this is maybe the most Lacanian side of this chapter. Uh, the fact that Freud, <clears throat> of course, he underlines the importance of the father, but at the same time, he mistrusts the father mm -hmm. because uh, he states that we have to uh, find different ways to anesthetize ourselves against suffering. So the father is not enough to do so. And uh, why? Because we can't bear a direct relationship with life. Uh, otherwise, reality becomes real. And I wonder if we could find here maybe a sort of bridge between this idea of finding a singular way to anesthetize ourselves and Lacan's concept of symptom. It, it is, yeah, uh, Gustavo, is this a question? Yes. <clears throat> if, so if the singular way to anesthetize uh, there's a relationship with the symptom. Is yes. that the mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The, 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 what makes a problem to me is mm -hmm. the way you use the anesthetic, the, the sorry, the and yeah, the anesthetize to anesthetize. Um, do you really think of that? Of course, I am using the, that, the idea of anesthetize in a general, in a, in a large sense, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because. Uh, a way of dealing with suffering and with the real. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
yeah but um but this in this symptom is not really something that uh, puts uh, a sleep puts the subject to sleep the way the anesthetic that, that does right the symptom is a way of making something of that suffering making something of the real right yeah i i mean anesthetize in the sense of a uh, sort a barrier between reality ah, okay. and the okay. real hmm? okay as a as a barrier yeah, yeah. A barrier something that makes us uh, possible to bear the real of, hmm, of yeah yeah with with the uh with the uh salvedad i don't know how to say that in english with, with the exception or with the proviso yeah yeah that in the case of the analyst he's informed about that barrier mm -hmm. uh perhaps he's aware yeah the, is aware and, and has a certain uh uh knowledge about it knows something about the barrier uh, he's a he's a yeah uh, uh, aware of it huh? whereas this uh, the singular ways that uh, people that the kind of pact that human being can make with existence with the real uh, sometimes uh, can be unknown to the subject themselves i think that that would probably be the the difference and in fact lacan says something uh, like that when when uh, when he says to uh, when he says to marguerite duras when he says you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, try to find the reason why you write you write and, and that's it right so that's the difference between the symptom of the analyst and for instance the singular way that a human being or an artist in the best cases can do in order to deal with or to put a barrier to deal with suffering or or with uh, with the real mm -hmm. i don't know gustavo if you would say yeah, yeah 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 okay thank you okay um there is a, another question coming um from fida uh about how freud seems to be making a distinction between those who have science and art and those who have religion as an answer to the obscurity of existence hmm? uh, is the attempt to liquidate and classify human beings close to Darwinian theory and selection in the pursuit of development or an authoritarian political moral division that follows authoritarian desires and interests, especially because in the Lacanian orientation, we talk about the existence of an individual and distinct confrontation for each individual with the real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's, um, it's interesting to, uh, to underline this distinction that uh, Freud makes of religion on the one hand and science and art uh, on the other. They're not, for him, they're not equivalent uh, ways of dealing with what we can now name the real. Uh, and, and he is, uh, Freud, uh, somehow uh, believes uh, that art or science are uh, better ways of dealing than religion and at the end he closes this chapter pointing at the failure of religion precisely to soothe uh, the, the the suffering of existence mm. so uh yeah freud uh, certainly he we can see that for him the best uh, bet is what has to do with especially sublimation uh, and also displacement but for him is science or art uh, finally and and there's uh -huh. also another question pending uh, nails from sarah uh, uh -huh. about the current situation and she she asks what is the connection uh, in relation to jouissance between voluntary isolation versus the injunction to be in quarantine Mm, that's an interesting question. 
Well, um, well, one is uh, voluntary and the other one is forced. But, um, but I. But we can question that. Yeah, we, we can. We can even question that. That because for a lot of people, part of their suffering is connected to an isolation that if we took if we mistook the subject for the ego we would think it's voluntary but from the moment we include the subject of the unconscious we don't uh, orient ourselves anymore by what's voluntary or not in the same way what's imposed by the other inverted commas we also try to include the hypothesis of the unconscious there hmm? and yeah it's yes yeah, certainly certainly it's true we can we we need to take that uh, into account certainly uh, and in fact uh, following what you just said florencia i um uh, i have um i have encountered these days uh, some people who have found uh, a lot of appeasement and peace in the confinement. Relief. Mm. A lot of relief, yes, yes. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of people who have had this need to establish contact through all the social uh, media and all the all the, the net in order to have contact with other people so uh, true that this um, the isolation as a way of uh, well distancing from the presence of the other the demand of the other that some subjects need in order to to yeah to to stand uh, the, the, the real, uh, uh, to withstand the real, uh, this uh, confinement that we are uh, living, sometimes this has made that very clear for certain subjects. Um, I, I, I find with one of the effects of these confinements is uh, um, to make evident how super ego and demanding is. Uh, the uh, the contemporary uh, ways of uh, in, in, in what in what you called um, the the regime of current civilization, uh, contrary to Freud's times, has become the regime of satisfaction. Exactly, uh, as opposed to a regime of uh, prohibition and renouncement. Uh -huh. Yeah, and this regime of satisfaction is the pure superego, mm -hmm. right? Is the, the 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 terrible superego, and this confinement has revealed that for mm -hmm. many subjects that find this certain calmness and and peace in this uh, in this uh, uh, this uh, oblige, not this this confinement that comes from the uh, powers of, of the state but that as you very well underline Florencia that is what the, you know, the, what the, the, the state can impose on individuals but then is the subject of the unconscious and that's something else and in that respect is the question was very good because we find this relationship between this individual isolation and the effects that this confinement is producing in, in certain subjects. Yeah, mm. it's very interesting how uh, for some people it becomes nearly a sort of being given permission for certain things uh, and, and, uh, uh, and allowing certain things. So it becomes a, an opening. And for others, uh, it's, it, it's the opposite. Uh, it's it's the imposition not to be able to access certain things. I I believe personally that we are we're going to uh, we are 
going through the experience of this and clinically there will be many lessons uh, that we will absolutely be, that we will be taught uh, by our analysants by our colleagues by uh, what what uh, the effects and and the different articulations even all the discussion that took place in the chat about uh, sublimation distinctions. Um, I remember last week somebody, I think it was Joanne, who mentions that um, she found in the clinic that a lot of people were turning to religion or were finding religion at this time. Uh, so, so yeah, effects that will have no doubt to be elucidated in time. Mm -hmm, certainly. Uh, there's uh, another question relating to a footnote. If I understand correctly, this, is, this comes from our colleague Perla in Israel. Uh, it's regarding Freud's last footnote on page 84. A note added in 1931. I feel impelled to point out at least of the gaps that have been left in the account given above. No discussion of the possibilities of human happiness should omit to take into consideration the relation between narcissism and object libido. We require to know what being essentially self-dependent signifies for the economics of the libido. Mm -hmm. The question is? What is the there's Can you a question? Say something about that. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's um yeah. news. The question is for you as our commentator, but also is open to anyone who please raise your hand or send a message and uh, we'll we'll put you through. Yeah. Um, it's true that, uh, that we will need Lacan to answer this question. We can, we can uh, sometimes when we read Freud, or at least uh, what it happens to me, I can uh, think of the questions that Lacan put himself to develop certain things about uh, some of uh, the, 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 the some of Freud's uh, sentences, and I think that in order to answer this uh, this question, which is the uh, the tension between narcissism and object libido, we have all the development that Lacan makes precisely. This is what Lacan invents: the object A. We can say. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. I think that the object A is what comes, what comes to answer precisely this tension, this relation that is in terms of tension between narcissism and object libido. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, that's the way in a, I would synthesize the answer, but I, 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 um, this is what the, the first thing that came to my mind when I read um, this, uh, this, uh, this sentence. Uh -huh. Because there is in because in in the libido there is always necessarily a loss of narcissism, necessarily, and it's Lacan who, with the object A, explains why. Mm -hmm. Very good. We have uh, still a little bit of time. If anyone would like to take the floor. Um, Linda can open the microphone for you. Uh, to Marina. No, Marina, I didn't check the question. Uh, Linda, can you open Rick's microphone and then Marina's perhaps? Both open. Okay. Hello. I, I don't see them. Rick, are you here? Hello, Rick. <laughs> Hi, Naios. How are you? Thank you so okay. much for uh... all, all our participants. This is Rick Lose in Dublin. Yes, I was. Uh, so thank thank you very much, uh, Naios. Um, 
uh, and uh, for a fantastic uh, talk. I was just wondering about the, uh, indeed that uh, footnote uh, that uh, uh, just came up, the last footnote, uh, and I was wondering indeed whether uh, our, our cultural super ego uh, demanding that we enjoy uh, and uh, in, so the demand of jouissance essentially that that pushes us in the direction of in effect in fact what Freud I think is saying in this uh, this chapter we're pushed in the direction of self-dependence in other words in the uh, jouissance out of objects and gadgets and so on so in a sense perhaps you could you could even talk about uh, an effect of the an addictification of society Definitely, definitely, it's very good. Yeah, it's uh, our society is the society of addiction. Yeah, of what, what this the super ego becomes a command to enjoy, and this is why uh, certain uh, people, certain patients of mine, that uh, call me or because I don't, I can't see them now because of the confinement. But some of them uh, talk to me on the phone and they tell me how relieved they feel, and precisely. Mm because there is a certain barrier, a certain distance with this push to enjoy. Huh? This is a structure of, of, of addiction. Mm -hmm. And others have, uh, uh, have the need to continue being addicted. And uh, the screen provides a whole wealth of, uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, mm -hmm. of addictions. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is, the coordinates of our uh, addictive uh, uh, society in a way that it was not Freud's society. That's why uh, Freud can, uh, we can see a difference between Freud and Lacan, uh, the last Lacan, Freud can still uh, pose the question of happiness in terms of castration and loss of Jewish sons and what to do with that, pay, that price that has to be paid in terms of loss of Jewish sons. Whereas in our society it's not possible, and that's why Lacan says castration is Jewish sons. Yes, and yes. in face of that, he has to invent something like this knowledge of Jewish sons, how to do with it, uh, how to do with it in a non-religious way, which is what yoga and Freud mentions in a non-religious way, but how to do with it, because this is the society uh, we, we are in. Mm -hmm. Even though, as uh, um, Gustavo de Sal pointed, even in this text, we can see the decline of the father. Even though Freud makes a recurse to it, there is a decline of the father. Mm -hmm. um, Niels, we have uh, two, two questions. Um, uh, one is uh, from uh, Deviani, who asks about the sentence, thanks to the role which fantasy has assumed in mental life. I don't know if it's easy to, to respond or to say something more um, without the context, but... I, I remember this sentence. I remember because um, I, I, I immediately, I immediately related that sentence to the uh, to the primary fantasy that, uh, that Lacan uh, constructs. And it's true that, uh, that the neurotic subject, at least, obtains <laughs> satisfaction out of the fantasy. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's a source of fantasy, right? Uh, it's a source of, it's a source of uh, an aesthetic, uh, like uh, Gustavo de Sal was saying, the, the fantasy is uh, certainly, the, and the, fundamental, the fundamental fantasy as a as a form of uh, being anesthetized. Exactly, and obtaining satisfaction of that because it's true. Because the fundamental fantasy is what Gustavo de Sal was saying: the barrier to the real, right? So, uh, so certainly, I think that that sentence in the Freudian way, we can somehow catch something of what uh, Lacan then can develop later mm -hmm. with the fundamental fantasy, precisely that, that gives us satisfaction. And in fact, we can see that with fantasy when uh, most, 
for instance, read books, novels, or, or, um, or films, especially in literature. There are, to my understanding, two kinds of literature. There is one literature that appeals to fantasies and one literature that is more symptomatic. Right? So every time, a lot of novels that uh, catch uh, the reader precisely because they develop certain fantasies that touch somehow the fundamental fantasy of the reader and that produces satisfaction and that produces this kind of uh, effect. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that this, is, this is the way I would link this sentence that uh, Freud uh, uh, writes in this chapter with the effect of fundamental fantasy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the last question uh, comes from Marina, if, if the mic can be opened. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you for uh, your lecture. It was wonderful. I would like to ask um, about a remark you made um, regarding uh, knowledge about Zuisans and knowledge of Zuisans. What's the difference in your opinion? Has, uh, it has to do with real and unconscious, for example? Yeah. Um, well, in French, there is this savoir de la, savoir de la jouissance. It, we can read that uh, is the jouissance that has the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there is a knowledge about jouissance, right? And I think that uh, when Lacan uses this expression, uses it in chapter uh, nine and in seminar 19, about these religions like the meditation, the tantras, the Sufism, that uh, is not like uh, there, there is, uh, Jewishans is the object of the knowledge, but that knowledge itself is this savoir itself, is an elaboration on Jewishans. And I think that that is very subtle, but uh, this is what uh, happens at, uh, what, um, what I think it's, uh, what Lacan says about an analysis, right? Is in an analysis, it's something that we learn about the forms of Jewishans, but we learn it with an effect that, that that learning, that knowledge has a direct effect on the jouissance of the, of the subject, of the speaking being. There is not a, there is not a relation subject-object, right? When we know something about the, our own jouissance, that has an effect of our own, on our own jouissance. And this is le savoir de la jouissance. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, I, I found that, that very, what, I, what interested me about this paragraph and seminar 19 is how uh, Lacan uh, says that this is what happens in these uh, religions, that Freud makes a remarks here, mm -hmm. um, and that that gets lost in Christianity and in philosophy after Socrates. Mm -hmm. And it's true that psychoanalysis can do something like that, but not like that, because it's not in a religious way that uh, psychoanalysis operates on the, the sense of the speaking being. But one thing that is very interesting, I said it last week, I was shocked at find yoga and meditation being mentioned. It was for me as if I, as if I hadn't re read this before, um, and, and I certainly had, but anyway, um, mm -hmm. because we, we witnessed the commodification of these practices, which both Freud and Lacan referred to as they try to conceptualize something of the problem of the encounter between language and the body, 
for the human being. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's crucial for these practices when they are taken by our Western uh, capitalist societies, that way of uh, treating the encounter of the body and language itself, the language of each uh, community, if you like, uh, it's completely perverted. Absolutely. Yes. Beyond, beyond the fact that it's made into a business and into a, a ready-made solution and blah, blah, blah. Uh, beyond that, I think for us, it's, it's interesting to explore this question. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are still some questions. Uh, John um, and Federico uh, and Marina have spoken again. The good news is that Neus is going to be with us again in a few weeks because each commentator is going to participate twice. So um, you, you, you can hold on to some of your, of your questions, remarks and bring them back. Um, and um, uh, the one thing that I would like to say is we will know uh, retrospectively after this whether there was any problem or not with the registration and the subscription. We've been 110 people on a Saturday morning uh, coming together, reading, speaking. Um, that makes me very happy, I have to say. Uh, and I want to thank you all. There were an equal number of people who registered and weren't here. So I think uh, we look into possible technical difficulties, but we'll also look into the um, arrow with which Neus um, read this chapter today for us which is impeccable. It's how in the title of this essay, there is a question and its answer. Uh, with, the, with the logic of Lacan's interpret desire and its interpretation are not two things. Desire is, is its, its interpretation. And Neus told us that uh, the discomfort, the misfortune, the malaise uh, in civilization is civilization. <laughs> in other words, it's to have to go from the one to the other. It's to have to uh, hook oneself up into language, into the symbolic. And that, that discomfort is at the same time our most particular singular thing, the way we experience that discomfort, our symptom. Uh, there is a price to be paid. Uh, that's what I'm, I'm taking today from, from our meeting. Uh, 